Jerusalem channel is made possible by viewer support. Thanks for watching. We're on the little train that goes from Jerusalem's Jaffa Gate and weaves through the sacred old city down to the Western Wall to pray. And we want to invite you to come along and support us financially so that the Jerusalem Channel can continue to move in the presence of God throughout this old city and throughout this nation. Thank you for supporting us, and we invite you to go to the donate page of our website, JerusalemChannel.tv. God bless you out of Zion. One of the most curious references in the book of Revelation is John's description of a woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet. She was crowned with 12 stars and crying out with intense labor pains. Then another sign appeared in heaven. The tail of a great red dragon swept a third of the stars of heaven down to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman waiting to devour her child. She gave birth to a son who was destined to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Let's explore this apocalyptic vision out of Revelation chapter 12. Shalom, I'm Christine Darg. In Revelation 12, the Apostle John saw great visions. The Greek word for great here is mega. John experiences mega visions for the last days. Everything in this chapter has huge significance. A number of years ago, I watched a Christmas movie depicting the Virgin Mary as a young Jewish girl giving birth to Jesus in a crude stable with the animals watching. Such humble, mundane circumstances. Yet, creatively, the movie camera zoomed out into outer space to give us glimpses of the heavenly bodies in alignment. And although Messiah's exact timeline had been foretold in Daniel chapter 9, most of the people on the planet were in the dark about Bible prophecies that were being fulfilled at the birth of Jesus. But in recent times, anyone interested in astronomy can experience the so-called Revelation 12 sign in our contemporary night sky. Due to the popularity of YouTube, many Bible believers are watching videos online about the astronomical alignment involving the constellations Virgo and Leo, and the sun, moon, and planets, Mercury, Mars, Venus, and Jupiter. This occurred in September 2017. But let's be clear, we're not getting into astrology or the occult with this actual alignment in the heavenlies. Some actually claim that this was the great portent prophesied in Revelation chapter 12, a sign of the end times. Others claim that such interstellar signs amount to nothing more than Rorschach tests in the skies because people tend to see what they want to see in the constellations. But we can know for certain, according to this word of God, the existence of the Jewish state, once again, after nearly two millennia, is no coincidence. And neither was the jubilee of the reunification of Israel's capital, Jerusalem, under Jewish sovereignty. Fifty years plus have now passed since the June 1967 Six Days War, when the Jewish people miraculously recaptured Jerusalem. And Jesus said in his Olivet Discourse that when we see the fig tree, Israel, blossom again, and when we see Jerusalem no longer under the domination of Gentile nations, we should look up because he'll be returning soon. Well, for centuries, Bible scholars have debated the identity of the woman in Revelation 12. Some say she represents the nation of Israel. Others say she represents the church. 
while others say the woman was the Virgin Mary who gave birth to Jesus. At All Saints Church in Hereford, England, the woman of Revelation 12 is depicted in its main stained glass window. I've never seen that in any other church. And it's rather obvious from the artist's interpretation that the woman of Revelation 12 was the Madonna and her child, the baby Jesus, wrapped in swaddling clothes. At her feet is the moon and she's crowned with 12 stars. Some commentators claim the woman of Revelation 12 is indeed the Virgin Mary because Mary was forced to flee into the wilderness of Egypt with Joseph and Jesus after King Herod's decree to kill all the infant boys in Bethlehem. Other scholars through the centuries have envisioned the woman as the church on its pilgrim journey through this present age, nourished by God while existing among a vast multitude of pagans. Matthew Henry's Bible commentary is typical of this view. He wrote that the church under the emblem of a woman was seen by the apostle John clothed with the sun, alluding to the son of righteousness. Matthew Henry wrote that her crown of 12 stars represented the 12 apostles and so on and so forth. While these interpretations have some merit, nevertheless, many other Bible scholars believe the identity of the woman of Revelation 12 is none other than the nation of Israel. And her story is being played out on earth right now. Actually, in the book of Revelation, there are four symbolic women. The first woman is named after the notorious Jezebel. She appears in Revelation chapter 2. We know her namesake from Hebrew scripture, Jezebel, wife of Israel's king Ahab, an evil idolater, an impudent queen whose name is forever synonymous with a shameless woman. Jesus warned that Jezebel's adulterous worldly influence was not to be tolerated in the church. The second woman in Revelation is the object of our study found in chapter 12, and I'll come back to her in a minute because she's very significant. The third woman is the scarlet whore of chapter 17, a harlot representing the apostate church. And a fourth woman in the book of Revelation is the wife of the lamb in chapter 19. So there's Jezebel representing paganism, a scarlet woman representing the apostate church, the wife of the lamb who was the bride, the true church. But there's also the woman of Revelation 12, our study today, who represents Israel. You see, Israel is depicted frequently as the wife of God. Throughout her history, she's been an unfaithful wife, but in the end, God will restore her to faithfulness and a great reconciliation will take place. It's even beginning now. So throughout the Hebrew Bible, Israel is described as a woman, the wife of God. By contrast, in the New Testament, the church is called a bride. The bride of Christ doesn't become a wife until the end of the book at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But until then, she's always a bride in waiting, a chaste virgin, as the Apostle Paul described her in 2 Corinthians 11, 2, waiting for the bridegroom to return. I believe it's the most accurate interpretation to see the woman of Revelation 12 as the nation of Israel. And this shouldn't be surprising because Israel is a key player in the last days. After all, Paul wrote in Romans 11 that eventually all of Israel will be saved. While many messianic prophecies were fulfilled in the Lord's first coming, Jesus, Yeshua, has yet to occupy the throne of his ancestral father, David. And Jesus is definitely promised the Davidic kingdom because of the prophecy of the angel Gabriel made to Mary in Luke chapter 1. Gabriel told Mary that her son will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. He said, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Also, and this is very significant, Zechariah chapters 12 and 13 prophesy that in the future, Israel will look upon the one whom they've pierced and mourn bitterly for him as for an only son. 
Then a fountain of cleansing will be open for Israel's national salvation. Now let's consider some clues about the woman of Revelation 12. She's clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head there are those 12 stars and a crown. This description recalls imagery describing Israel and her 12 tribes in Joseph's prophetic dream that we find in Genesis 37 and verse 9. Then Joseph had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Look, he said, the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. Thus, the 12 stars on the woman's head are symbolic of Israel's 12 tribes, including Joseph. Israel in Revelation 12 is depicted as a woman, a mother, about to give birth. And this is also an accurate imagery concerning Israel, as found, for example, in Isaiah 26, 17, which says, as a woman with child and about to give birth writhes and cries out in pain. This is how we were in your presence, O Lord. Also in Isaiah 54, God speaks as a husband to his wife, Israel. And in Isaiah 66, we read about Israel that before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before she was in pain, she delivered a boy. It says, who has heard of such a thing as this? Can a nation be born in a day? Yet, as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. Well, in the Bible, Israel is seen as a woman and as a mother. She agonized and suffered for centuries, waiting and longing for the child who would destroy Satan and bring in the promised Davidic kingdom. Way back in Genesis 3.15, it was prophesied that the seed of the woman, the Messiah, would crush the head of the serpent, but that the serpent would bruise the heel of Messiah. Satan, the old serpent, is called a dragon in the book of Revelation. The dragon pursues the woman because he must destroy Israel in order to stop God's plan of redemption. If Israel is destroyed, God simply will not be able to fulfill all of his promises. So now we understand the demonic cause of anti-Semitism and why anti-Semitism never goes away. Satan must destroy the Jews and wipe out Israel if he hopes to win his war against God Almighty. But of course, that's impossible. The dragon in Revelation 12 is described as red because of much satanic bloodshed. Satan's desire has always been to exterminate the woman to wipe out the royal line of the deliverer, King Messiah. Satan has never been able to completely destroy Israel, but he has made many threats and efforts to annihilate her. Revelation 12.5 says she gave birth to a son, a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. This is a reference to Psalm 2 and her male child is Jewish, a son of Abraham of the tribe of Judah. He is both the prophesied Numbers 2417, star of Jacob, and the scepter of Israel, a descendant of King David. Despite Satan's efforts to kill the child at birth, the incarnation happened and the child was born and afterwards caught up to the throne of God and he will rule all the nations when he returns with a rod of iron. And then Revelation 12 says the woman was persecuted and had to flee into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God to be nourished for 1,260 days. Satan will try to pursue the woman during the time of the great tribulation, but the Lord will hide her, protect and nourish her this was also prophesied by Jesus in Matthew 24. He warned, So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination of desolation described by the prophet Daniel, and the margin says, let the reader understand. Young's literal translation says, whoever is reading, let him observe. Then also let those who are in Judea, what the world today calls the West Bank, let those in Judea flee to the mountains. And Jesus said, let no one on the housetop come down to retrieve anything from his house. 
and let no one in the field return for his cloak. And how miserable those days will be, Jesus said, for pregnant and nursing mothers. So he said, pray that your flight won't occur in the winter or on the Sabbath day. For at that time, he says, there's going to be great tribulation, unmatched from the beginning of the world until now and never to be seen again. And he said, if those days had not been cut short, nobody would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. So Jesus said the trigger of these events will be when the Antichrist desecrates the temple and presumes to set himself up as God in Jerusalem. When that happens, Revelation 12, 6 says the Israelis are going to run for the hills in the wilderness. The biblical territories, no doubt, of Moab, Ammon, and Edom, due east, over the Jordan River, across the Dead Sea to ancient Edom. Intriguingly, the prophet Daniel explains how this refuge will be providentially available because Daniel 1141 prophesied that the Antichrist will enter the glorious land of Israel and many nations will fall. But Moab, Edom, and the best part of Oman, these territories in Jordan today, will escape out of his hands, making that territory a refuge for Israel. And through the years, I've heard of numerous reports of Bible prophecy buffs who've hidden Bibles in secret places. For example, in Petra, the abandoned rose red city in what is today Jordan. Revelation 12 promises that God has prepared a place for the woman and he will provide for her, nourish her, perhaps even feeding Israel once again with manna from heaven. For 1260 days, the woman will be cared for by God in the wilderness. That amounts to three and a half years, the time, scholars say, of the great tribulation. And Daniel 12 prophesies, at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands watch over your people, will rise up, and there will be a time of trouble such as never has occurred from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Hallelujah. And this is also the promise of a companion verses in uh, Jeremiah 30, which says, Why do I see every man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor and every face turned pale? How awful that day will be. None will be like it. It is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he will be delivered out of it. Hallelujah. Ultimately, Romans 11 is a biblical guarantee that all Israel shall be saved but not without first the fury of Satan being unleashed on them. Revelation 12, 7 goes on to describe war in heaven between the archangel Michael, the prince of the people of Israel, and the dragon, and the dragon's angels. Michael wins a very decisive battle, and Satan and a third of the angels are cast down to earth. And that's why the great tribulation is such a terrible, unprecedented time. All the rebel angels of the universe will hit the earth running in fury. And verse 8 says, they will no longer be able to have access to heaven. So heaven rejoices because Satan falls from heaven. Heaven rejoices because the accuser of the brethren has finally been cast down. He who accuses them day and night before our God. Revelation 12, 12 says, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea. With great fury, the devil has come down to you, knowing he has only a short time. Verse 13 continues, And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown to the earth, he pursued the woman who'd given birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle to fly into the wilderness, where she was nourished for a time and times and half a time. This is Bible code prophetic language for three and a half years. We must consider this verse 14 in the two wings of the great eagle that were given to the woman to fly into the wilderness. Does that mean that there could be some special flights out of Judea into the Jordanian wilderness? 
Well, I think all means of transportation will be used, especially if we pray that the escape is not on a Sabbath day, as Jesus told us to pray, because religious Jews can't travel on the Sabbath. And it's well known that in the Middle East, flash floods in the wadis are dangerous because of their sudden nature and fast moving water. That's one of the reasons I believe the Lord said to pray that their flight will not be in the winter time because many people have literally been drowned in the desert because of sudden flash floods. Verse 16 says, the earth helped the woman and swallowed up the river that poured from the dragon's mouth to try to sweep her away in a torrent. And the dragon was enraged at the woman. This is certainly a description of anti-Semitism. And the flood coming against the woman brings to mind Isaiah 59, which proclaims, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Scholars have asked, how shall we read this verse? Where in English should we put a comma? For example, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, comma, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Or when the enemy shall come in, comma, like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. You see, because the original Hebrew has no punctuation marks, the verse can be rendered that the Lord will come on the scene like a raging flood to wipe out the hatred of Israel's enemies. A generation ago, the Nazis invaded this world like a flood, yet they were vanquished as God raised up a standard of nations against them. The Spirit of the Lord always has a plan to thwart every stratagem of the enemy. The enemy's evil kingdom at times does make tremendous assaults and invasions like a flood. In our personal lives and in the lives of entire nations and regions, evil can suddenly overwhelm us like a tsunami. But the good news that all intercessors must proclaim is that the Spirit of the Lord is forever stronger than the enemy. And in the book of Revelation, there's a sure promise of help for God's people in the time of a hellish flood, even in the desert of the Middle East. A great promise of escape from a demonic flash flood is prophesied here for Israel's future. Just as God intervened supernaturally to protect Israel from Pharaoh's pursuing armies during the Exodus, this time it says the earth itself will become Israel's ally and it will swallow the forces of darkness pursuing her. The enemy is compared to a flood because floods are rapid, violent, and destructive. The Lord's mercies, on the other hand, can be compared to a holy flood sweeping away his enemies. And who was the standard bearer who must come on the scene? According to Isaiah 59, it is the Spirit of the Lord who will raise up a standard. Spirit-filled volunteers for the present Battle must be enlisted for prayer. Are you willing to intercede for flash floods of the Holy Spirit? We in our ministry are looking for fresh recruits to pray as watchmen on the walls. And we want to prophesy flash floods of mercy over our nations that are desperately in need of an extension of God's grace and a great harvest of souls before the coming of the Lord. We also need flash floods of refreshing over our individual souls and revival. So let's rally behind the Lord of Heaven's armies in prayer, asking Him to lift up His awesome standard of victory over the vicious powers of darkness. And as we continue to pray in faith, the Lord of hosts will break and baffle wicked, bloodthirsty persecutors as His royal standard is uplifted so that the King of glory may come in. Lord, we pray for you soon to flood the Middle East with your glory until the whole earth is covered from Jerusalem with your knowledge as the waters cover the sea. Amen. Well, I pray to God that he's working in the hearts of anyone who has not yet received Jesus as Savior and Lord. And if that's you, I urge you to receive him now, today, and in the meantime, let's take fresh courage in light of the amazing divine intervention that's prophesied for the Middle East. And concerning the nation of Iran, modern-day Persia, 
which is continually making threats against Israel, two prophecies are happening at the same time. On the one hand, Iran is attacking Israel as prophesied for the last days in Ezekiel 38.5. But also many Iranian pastors and evangelists believe that Iran, which is disillusioned with its hardline religious leaders, can become a Christian nation in one generation. The underground church in Iran is growing exponentially. In fact, there's a prophecy in Jeremiah 49.38 where God says he will set his throne in Elam, which is a biblical area, in what is now southern Iran. That verse speaks of a great revival with the presence of the Lord in Elam, in Iran. We know that many Muslims are deciding to follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the Savior of the world, Messiah Jesus. According to IranWire.com, in a speech to Shia preachers, Iran's intelligence minister, Mahmoud Alavi, recently reported that Christianity is spreading in parts of Iran. He said, these converts are ordinary people whose jobs are just selling sandwiches or similar things. He said, we had no choice but to summons them, to ask them why they were converting. Alavi said, some of them said that they were looking for a religion that gives them peace. He said, we told them that our religion is the religion of brotherhood and peace. But they responded by saying that all the time, they only see the Muslim clerics and those who preach from the pulpit talking against each other. So if Islam is the religion of peace, then before anything else, there must be cordiality and peace among the clerics themselves, these converts were saying. And I think the same thing could be said concerning Christian clergymen. Amen. Well, while we can, let's be strong and take action, sharing the gospel always in love and doing the exploits the Lord calls each one of us to do. And let's stay in touch on social media or at our website at exploits.tv where you can sign up to receive our free color magazine, Exploits. That name is based upon Daniel 1132 which says that the people who know God, you see, we have to know God. When we know God, it says we'll be strong and we'll take action. We'll do, as the King James Bible says, we'll do exploits. And don't forget, our Jerusalem Channel app is available free to download from your app store. And at our website, you can learn about our Holy Land conferences, which believe me, are life changing. And so, until next time, earnestly contending for the faith and praying always for the peace of Jerusalem, I'm Christine Darg. Shalom. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha.